We are delighted to welcome Nietu, who will present today's seminar. She is the new postdoc here with us at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Dublin. And I hand you over to Nietu. She has recently joined us from Bopa. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk about a unitary matrix, uh, a unitary matrix model description of the growth process of Young diagrams. And this is based on these two works with my collaborators, Orbo Chattopadhyay, Shubhankar Datta, Dibangshu Mukherjee, and Sanhita Parihar. So here's a brief outline of my talk. I'll start by introducing the main objects of my talk, the Young Diagrams and their growth process. In particular, I'll talk about the planchural growth process. Then I'll talk about how Young Diagrams appear in unitary matrix models. So this is going to be a very brief overview of the two things that I'm trying to relate. And then I'll talk about a matrix model description for the planchural growth process. Then I'll move on to the generalizations, the Q deformation of the planchural growth and a matrix model description for the Q deformed planchural growth process. And then I'll finally talk about the phase space and the Hilbert space description of the unitary matrix models. So let me start with the Young diagram. So in very simple terms, Young diagrams are nothing but a collection of boxes arranged in a particular manner. That depends on the convention you'd like to choose to describe your Young diagram. They are characterized by an integer K, which counts the total number of boxes and its partition. So this is how a typical Young diagram looks in the English notation, where the boxes are arranged in left justified rows with non-increasing length. And there are uh, other notations for, for the Young diagrams where the, the boxes might be arranged in, uh, in, a, in where the uh, rows length are increasing or in a rotated form as well. So, no. uh, but in, in my talk, most of the time I'll be just, uh, my Young diagrams will look like this. And uh, these objects are very useful uh, because they provide a convenient diagrammatic way to describe irreducible representations of symmetric groups, general linear groups, and special unitary groups. They are also helpful in describing uh, many other objects, but uh, I'll be concerned only with the representation here. here. So the, the questions about the asymptotic behavior of representations can be translated to questions about the asymptotic behavior of Young diagram. And by asymptotic here, I mean that the number of boxes becomes very large. And uh, why are we interested in this? Because the asymptotic theory of representations is very helpful in investigating the higher rank and infinite dimensional groups, which appear in physics a lot. So uh, this is how uh, a growth process of Young diagram looks like. We start with the diagram with no box, and then we keep on adding one box at each stage in all possible allowed ways. Then we can also assign a probability to each addition of the box, which we can call the transition probability. If the transition probability has this particular form, then the growth process is referred to as the planchural growth process. And the probability, this, uh, this probability does not depend on the history of the growth process, that is why this process is a Markovian growth process. Now, following this transition probability, if we calculate the probability measure associated to each diagram at level K, then it is given by the so-called planchural measure. And that is where the name for this process comes from. And uh, these uh, the mathematicians have studied these growth processes of Young diagrams. And there are some famous results about these growth processes. There's this theorem called the limit shape theorem, which says that young diagrams growing according to a planchural growth process take a particular shape as the number of boxes become very large. So as the number of boxes becomes large, we need to rescale the diagrams to look at the boundary curve. And with that rescaling, the boundary curve becomes a smooth curve and it takes a particular form, which is called the limit shape. So here, this di Young diagram is uh, drawn in a rotated notation, which is called the Russian notation. And so these mathematicians use uh, mostly use this convention for Young diagrams. 
And then Kerov also introduced a differential model to capture the growth of Young diagrams. He introduced a continuous time parameter, and then he showed that the Young diagrams growing according to Flanchural measure, they follow a first order partial differential equation, which he referred to as the auto model equation. And the limit shape is a unique solution of that auto model equation in far future with the Young diagram with no box as an initial condition and the far past. Now, uh, now we, what we would like to do is we'd like to describe this growth process through a matrix model. And why we think that it should be possible is because the classical solutions of unitary matrix models can also be described in terms of asymptotic Young diagrams. So uh, this is uh, the partition function of a unitary matrix model. Here these U's are some N cross N unitary matrices. DU is a measure on the unitary group. And this S of U can be an arbitrary function of these matrices, which we can either call the potential or the action of the model. So in this talk, the unitary matrix model that we'll see will uh, either be will uh, either be of this form or this form. These are the these are a particular class of models, uh, the so-called single placket model, and these two are related to each other through a parameter redefinition. So once we have the form of action like this, we can just simply expand this exponential and use the Frobenius formula to write the partition function as a sum over representations of the unitary group. And once we have that, we can further represent the sum over representation in terms of a sum over different Young diagram. So we have the sum over representation and we can just write it as a sum over the total number of boxes K and its partitions. Sorry, Neetu, can you, can you say what the parameter redefinition that takes you between the two models is? Yeah, so if you just uh, uh, replace a beta n with a n expectation of trace u n, then you will get this model. So what you will actually have to do to go from this to this is to expand the exponential and then make the comparison because the redefinition is really beta n equal to a n, the expectation of trace u n. Is that okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, for the simplicity of calculations, we introduce these new variables HIs, which are monotonically decreasing. And then uh, in the large n limit, we can define these new continuous variables, such that the partition function takes the form of a path integral with an effective action. So here the n dependence we can uh, write uh, write at the here, and then this effective action is some order one quantity. So we can uh, we can regard this factor of n square as h cross inverse, such that the n goes to infinity uh, infinity limit is equivalent to doing the semi classical approximation. And in that approximation, the partition function is dominated by the saddle points of the effective actions. So we can write the saddle point equation and then we can solve for the classical solutions as the solutions of that saddle point equation. And in the large n limit to characterize the different Young diagrams, we introduce a density function like this. And since these variables H are monotonically decreasing, the, the Young diagram density has an upper bound. So that is, that is how the large N or the classical solution of a unitary matrix model can be described as, as some asymptotic Young diagram. So this N goes to infinity limit is actually the number of boxes of Young diagrams going to infinity. Now uh, to see the Flanchural growth process as being described by a unitary matrix model, we first write down a partition function for the growth process. So we define a Young lattice where this YK are the collection of all Young diagrams with the with boxes K. And we can think of this as a canonical ensemble of diagrams with the same macroscopic variable K so that we can write down a grand canonical partition function for the Young lattice. And this is how the partition function looks like. It can be exactly evaluated and it turns out to be this. But in this form, it does not encode any dynamics. 
So we regularize this partition function by introducing a constraint on the number of boxes in Young diagram. We say that the number of rows in a Young diagram cannot exceed a, a very large integer n. And once we regularize this partition function, this is exactly the same as the partition function of this unitary matrix model. This is a very well studied unitary matrix model, which is also related to by a peer parameter redefinition to the gross witten wadia model. And the large in solutions of this model are well known. So uh, as I told you that the uh, Young diagram density has an upper bound. So uh, for this model, there exists two solutions, one where the, where the uh, density touches the upper bound and the other where it does not. But both these solutions cannot describe the Flanchereau growth process. And which one describes this process is determined by the symmetry of the growth process. So if we take two Young diagrams, which are related to each other through transposition, then the Flanchereau probability associated to those diagrams is same. So the solution must also have that property. And the symmetric solution of the cross witten wadia model, which is also called the no gap solution has that property, which is given by this function. This is the Young diagram density. It, it has this parameter xi, which takes values between zero and half. And the limiting value of this xi corresponds to the limit shape. And one can also evaluate the flangular probability associated to the solution, and it turns out to be almost equal to one. And one can further check that this this U of H also satisfies the auto model equation, where in this case, the renormalized number of boxes K prime plays the role of time T. So this gives us an alternate and a very simple proof of the limit shift theorem of Varshik, Kirov, and Logan in shift. Once we have these results, we can try to apply these, apply the similar techniques to, uh, to study other generalized growth processes. So there are these Q deformed Flanchereau growth processes where the probability is generalized by introducing a deformation parameter Q, which, which lies between zero and one. And there are different Q deformations that, that have been studied in the literature, but here I'm only going to talk about two of these. And uh, one of these is, is this one, which mostly appears in the mathematics literature and it follows from the representation theory of Eva Hori Heke algebras. Then there's this another one, which is which appears more in the physics because it, it appears in some topological string theory partition functions. So uh, people have studied uh, these Q deformed Flanchereau growth processes, but in any of these cases, the explicit form of the limit shape was not known. Here, uh, through a matrix model analysis, we can, we can write down an explicit form of the limit shape for this process and also an automodel equation. However, the first one of these uh, is uh, the saddle point equation for this growth process turns out to be a little more complicated and it is difficult to solve that equation exactly. So we could only solve that equation uh, perturbatively, but for, for the case of this measure, we could exactly solve the saddle point equation. And I'll, I'll only give the results for, for this case. However, uh, we also observe that qualitatively the behavior of the limit shape for those for both the cases is the same. So we again uh, do a similar analysis. We can write down a grand canonical partition function and we can do a saddle point analysis and we can find, find out the classical solution. And in the case of Q-deformed growth process, this is how the limit shape looks like. And as, as I told you that in case of the Flanchereau growth process, the limit shape was symmetric. The dominant Young diagram was a symmetric Young diagram under transposition. But for the case of Q-deformation, the symmetry of the diagram is lost and the, the limit shape is asymmetric under transposition. And this is the result for this is the result for this particular measure, but even for this measure, the, the symmetry property is broken and qualitatively the behavior of limit shape turns out to be the same. And then we can also write down our uh, auto model equation. Okay. Lambda, uh, lambda is the translation, is the equivalent to the parameter or Q, is it? Yes, yes. So we, we okay. uh, for us, uh, the parameter uh, is 
lambda. Okay. I mean, it is related to the deformation parameter Q. Uh, but you, yeah, and you are, it's very close, Q is very close to one. Is that uh, the limit that you're interested in? Uh, you are forced to take Not Q. really, because this is a double scaling limit. Or zero, sorry, it's Q is very close to zero. No, Q lies double? between zero and one. But you're taking G to zero, sorry, so Q is going to one, but and N is going to infinity. Yeah, yeah, so but, it is It is actually a double scaling limit. Yeah, but Q is, and it's, it's Q is essentially going to one, okay. I mean, uh, we cannot say that it is essentially going to one because it, it is not just G is going to zero. It is also N goes to infinity. So the lambda but, is- But is Q, doesn't Q doesn't depend on N. Yes. So it's presumably going to zero, going to one. It looks like that from here, but actually it's, uh, we cannot just say that G, I mean, the Q is close to one. This, this, uh, we define this new parameter such that so when we do the saddle point analysis of this partition function, we again write down it. We again try to uh, extract all the n dependence outside such that we have an order one quantity, which is the effective action. So that is where we, that is to do that, we introduce this new parameter lambda. But uh, I would say we cannot just say from here that Q is very close to one. It is still, it still lies between zero and one. Okay, all right, thanks. Can I ask a question? I'm getting confused. Sure. Uh, the number of partitions of the integer n for SN yeah. is some fixed number. I mean, you, one can't change it, it is given. Okay. Yes. Uh, so for large n, one can ask for the asymptotic values of this part, number of partitions. And, um, we are familiar okay. with this Rogers Ramanujan formula and so on. Okay. Now, no, I'm not. I'm sorry. I think, okay, in string theory, long ago it came. Okay. But anyway, what I am not understanding is how do all these parameters enter? Is it that there are there different asymptotic expansions of these partitions? What do they mean? I mean, number of partitions of n is a fixed number. Uh, n is not the number of partitions. N is the number of rows in, in the Young diagram. No. The, the, I, it's related to SUN. Sorry? Yes. It, it, so. Yeah, it's the N of the, I mean, the matrices are N cross N. No, but, but the original problem was the computation of the Young diagrams. Okay, yes. number of Young diagrams, okay, yes. or SN. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, any Young diagram is a representation of some, some SN, right? Yes, of course. So I thought you were beginning to compute the number of uh, partitions of N per SN. And that is the same as the number of irreducible representation, different irreducible representations of SUN as uh, no, we are uh, not computing the partitions of N. We are interested in knowing the behavior of the Young diagrams as the number of boxes becomes very large. And when we talk about the growth process, we are not really talking about any underlying group. We are just talking about the Young diagrams. I mean, it could be, they could be representations of any group. Yeah, so you are making SN for N large. I mean, you're writing down the partitions of N, but if you don't want to talk about, one doesn't want to talk about less than fine. But it is okay. the same as the, there's a correspondence between the number of partitions of N, the number of inequivalent representations of issue N. Yes. They're uh, they the same. Okay. okay. No, mm -hmm. there's no ambiguity. There's a fixed value. Number is fixed, has a fixed value. The number yes. of irreducible representations of issue N has a fixed value, okay? Yes. At a tensor rank uh, of uh, interest given by N, okay? Now, so what I don't understand is, what are these parameters? Maybe no. Denjo- These parameters? 
they're, they're, they're related to the probability that you, with which you add a particular type of young tableau. You could add, you could add them in different ways, Bob. You could say there's probability uh, three quarters of adding one, and there's probability a quarter of adding another. And you're going to get a different, it'll define a different process. She described for us what, it, what the Plancherel process was. Yeah, the probability of transition would be different. I mean, you assign a probability of adding a box. So it, at each step, you add a box in all possible allowed ways, and then you assign a transition probability to that. And then we try to see if, if with a particular transition probability, how does the boundary of a Young diagram looks like as we go to the very large number of boxes? Mm. If I take the number of, I will ask one more question. If I take the number, the partitions of n, okay, yeah. and I go to the partitions of n plus one, the okay. relationship between them is fixed. There is no probability. Is there's no probability there? It is a fixed thing. Okay. So yeah, I, I mean, in the sense that we know in how many possible ways we can add a box, and that will give us the partitions at n plus one, right? Yes. But, but no what I'm, there. Yeah, what I am not understanding is it is not a probability process; it's a deterministic process. If I have a computer, I can do it. Yeah, but we are talking about a growth process. I mean, uh, what is the probability of going from a, a diagram with n boxes to a diagram with n plus one boxes. So when we put a box, so uh, say, uh, let me just go back to the growth process one. So here, say from, from this young diagram, I can add a box in two different ways. I can add it here, or say I can, I can add it here. So what I'm saying is that, that there is a different probability associated to this transition and this transition. And for a planchier growth process, this is how it is determined. Okay, let me not stop you, go on. Yeah, well, maybe we can discuss it again. Then. Well, I think, I think it's clear from what you said that you could have said that uh, the probability was one for adding. If you go back, uh, Nieto, yeah. just, she could have insisted that the probability is one for adding one to the top one and zero for all of the others. Then you're going to get a very particular young tableau at very large n. It'll right. just go straight up along one line. It's still, a, it's still a growth process. Not a very interesting one, but it's a growth process. The, the Plancherel one is, an, is a rather nice one because it gives a nice symmetric one and she has a cuneiform one which looks equally what nice. Say, it seems to me that for some reason one decides that one retains only certain partitions of the integer n for larger. That's so, correct. Exactly. Why? why? Because they are related to the matrix model she's interested in. Okay. Right. So it's just that we start from uh, from no box and then we ask, say, we pick a random diagram, say this one, and we ask what is the probability of getting this diagram, it's starting from a diagram with zero box. And that is the probability, is, that is this probability if we follow a planchier growth process. And if we follow a different growth process, this could be a different probability. Okay. Okay. Carry on. Yeah. yeah. So uh, for uh, for the Q deform planchier growth process, we could do the same analysis. The saddle point we can we could solve the saddle point equation. But here, just from the partition function, it is not clear what is the matrix model that describes this growth process. So for that, we look at the phase space picture of the matrix model. So I've been only talking about the Young diagram description of the uh, unitary matrix models, but it also admits another equivalent description in terms of eigenvalues. So one can just go to a diagonal basis for these matrices U and describe the matrix model in terms of the eigenvalues. In that case, the large in solutions are given in terms of the eigenvalue density. And it was shown in a series of papers by these authors that for one Plackett model, 
there exists a relation between the eigenvalue density and the Young diagram density, which is also expected since they are different descriptions of the same model. So these two equations describe exactly the relation between the eigenvalue picture and the Young diagram picture. And for one Plackett model, this function has this particular form. And since for the Q-deformed growth process, we know the U of H using these relations, we can find out this function S of theta. And then comparing these two, we can say that the matrix model that describes this particular growth process is a single Plackett model with the parameters beta n given by this. Now, uh, once we have this relation between these two pictures, we can also talk about the phase space and say, since this is a quadratic equation, it admits two possible solution, which I'm denoting by H plus minus. These two, or these two solutions describe the boundary of a two dimensional phase space, which is spanned by these variables H and theta. So we can describe a phase space distribution function like this, such that the Young diagram density and eigenvalue density can both be obtained from this distribution function. And this looks very similar to a Thomas Fermi distribution at zero temperature. We can compare these two distribution and we can write down a single particle Hamiltonian density so that we also have a Hamiltonian description of this model. So just to show you how the phase space looks like this, these are the phase space droplets for the auto model class, which are the Young diagrams going according to the Plancherer probability. For that case, the H plus has this form and H minus is zero. The circular droplet corresponds to a Young diagram with no box. This corresponds to a Young diagram at some intermediate stage of the, of the process. And this, the, this, particular, uh, this particular geometry corresponds to the limit shape. So uh, now since uh, we can write down a, a, a Hamiltonian description of this model, we can as well quantize the system and uh, talk about a Hilbert space description. So again, for the, for the calculation of simplicity, we def redefine our variables, variables like this, and we can write down, uh, write down the Hamilton's equation of motion. And the boundary evolution equation is looks like this, which is a, a just double copy of the dispersion list KDB equation. Then we can introduce these Poisson brackets between these variables such that the evolution equation takes the standard form. And then we can we can talk about the fluctuations, the fluctuations about the classical solutions. And we see that the modes of those fluctuations satisfy Kashmiri algebra. So we get two copies of the Kashmiri algebra. These modes A's and these are the modes of H plus and H minus. And then we can construct a Hilbert space of this algebra. Uh, once we uh, have the Hilbert space, we define a mapping between the states and the space space geometries like this. So given a state psi, we evaluate the expectation value of H plus in that state, and that tells us the shape of the phase space geometry. So a ground state in that Hilbert space corresponds to a constant shift over the classical value, uh, and a generic excited state corresponds to some order H cross ripples over the classical surface, while if we define some coherent states, they correspond to, to some classical deformations over the classical value because apart from having this constant shift at order H cross, they also have this order one deformation. So we call these classical deformations. And these coherent states are the ones which also describe the automodal diagrams. So in particular, uh, the, the Q automodal diagrams are represented by these coherent states. And just to get the coherent states which describe the young diagrams of Plancherer growth process, we can just take the lambda goes to zero limit. And this description is useful to study the fluctuations of limit shape, which is also something mathematicians are interested in. We did not study the fluctuations of, of this limit shape, but if we consider this particular excitations over the coherent state corresponding to the limit shape, then we reproduce this result of Ivanov and Olshanki, who studied the fluctuations about limit shape of the Plancherer growth process. So uh, here's, a, here's a summary. 
what we show, uh, what we showed is that the growth processes of young diagrams can be studied through unitary matrix models. In particular, the planchural growth process is described as the evolution of the symmetric phase of the cross pattern Wadia model. And the q deformed planchural growth process is described by a single placket model where the parameters of the model depend on the deformation parameter q. Now, uh, once we have these results, one can uh, talk about the holographic dual of this unitary matrix model that describes the Q-deformed planchural growth. And we also saw that the boundary evolution of the phase space geometries of the matrix model uh, follow the KDV equation, which is a dispersionless KDV equation. So one can as well try to include a dispersive part and try to see how does the dispersive term affect the evolution. So this is an ongoing work. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Nietu. That was uh, fascinating, very fast for some of us. But uh, so we will uh, go to questions, and I'm sure there will be lots of them. I know I have several anyway. So who wants to start? I can start. Please, please, Bob, uh, go ahead. Really, an inquiry. From what I understand, what I heard is that even takes. Uh, say a, a partition of integer n. Okay, there are a lot of partitions. I can ask, starting from some reference partition, how many pathways are there to reach each other? Okay. Okay. Right. So you can ask. Therefore, you can assign so many fraction of the total uh, pathways is here, and another set of pathways are here, and so on, and define a probability measure on these events on these pathways. Okay. Right. From what I understand, one is studying here the uh, uh, the probability, this probability measure and this asymptotic values. Okay? This is what I understand. Okay, but yeah, I I don't understand so the, the, mutual... the probability that that you just said that you can we can talk about the all possible paths of going from one from one particular diagram to some other particular diagram. So actually, the square of that that number of paths turns out to be proportional to the planchural measure. That is how the, we get the planchural measure. Fine. Question is first. I don't understand this. The motivation for doing this. What is what does it tell? So if I were doing physics model, for example, mm -hmm. uh, since the partitions of n give you the irreducible representations of S to n, okay, mm -hmm. one can say that for large n. Uh, QCD, uh, as was done by Etroft and others, um, mm -hmm. this uh, quark formation will be most probable because there are many more ways of forming them. Okay. Is okay. this the kind of uh, motivation that is underlying this? Or, no. But Kerov is a mathematician. I have yes. interest in this book yes. and interest in representation theory of SN. Okay. It's very complicated. Okay. So, yes. Uh, uh, what is their interest in this? Why are they studying this? Okay. And Gopakumar, Gopakumar is Rajesh. Yes, yes. Now, why, let me, relative question is, uh, Gopakumar, Datta is you, is it? Um, your last name is Datta, no? No, 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 no. I don't have a last, I don't use a last name. Who is Datta? Uh, Datta is Shivankar Datta. Where is he in Bhopal? Yeah, he he he's, he has my PhD advisor. Okay, so question is, I, uh, why is Gopal uh, Rajesh interested in this? Why why is he? They interested? are not. Uh, they are not interested in in the growth process of Yang diagrams. They were interested in the phase space of unitary matrix models, and they were interested in that because uh, the because this one placket model are known to describe the gauge theories on some sp cross s1 kind of manifolds and then use the ads cfp correspondence to study string theories in, in ads space so they were interested yeah. in the phase space picture of unitary matrix model okay yeah, i am not really the, uh, just the second one but can you go back to your two uh, two models uh Neto, just uh which one uh for the back you wrote down two, two different matrix models that are related okay. by a transformation. Okay. Uh, here we go. Well, uh, the 
these are two different matrix models that are issues to explain are related by a, a reparameterization. The second one here uh, that she has in terms of AN is related to the counting of BPS states in uh, string in supersymmetric string theories. Or in the n equals four supersymmetric Yang Mills, for instance, it's really yeah, it's, uh, that it's particular one. By Lit, Luna, and Maldacena. And there are many, yeah. yeah. But it's related to, to the counting of BPS states. So yeah. you can That's ask, what is the asymptotic form of the counting of What are the asymptotic numbers of BPS states? Why are, she, okay, let me come back. So the only paper I know, well, the paper I am familiar with about by Rajesh is, there is a paper by him and David Gross when they were students. Okay? And that, uh, that is trying to solve all matrix models. Okay? And they are using this large end limit of all matrix. And they get this Kuntz algebras. Okay? And they write down a formula using Kuntz algebras. Okay? Again, in terms of harmonic oscillators, they can write the solution. What I don't know is, well, if you tell me that they're just counting states, okay? but I don't know the motivation, physics motivation for this, or maths motivation. I, one cannot say, actually, I can't say, I will just do it. Okay? No, the what physics the say? physics motivation, I mean, there, there's a lot of physics motivation, but counting BPS states is the easy one to explain in there. Okay. You could count uh, a small number of BPS states for, in, for uh, particular uh, values when it's when you get just small young di number of young diagrams but when you get to very large n and large numbers of young diagrams well what what is the shape of that what are, what are typical young diagrams that occur what are most probable ones it depends on the physics so why i mean bps says from what i know are related to this uh, this uh, orthosymplectic groups and so on. So OSP slash something and so on. Okay, uh, number of BPS states are the representation uh, zero mode representations of these group short representations of these groups. Okay, like for example, it's O two slash one or O two slash two and so forth. Okay, uh, that involves also supersymmetry. Here I don't see supersymmetry. Okay? So it's still not very clear to me. Okay. Very supersymmetry here. BPS states are not supersymmetry. Counting the number of super of BPS states does is actually doesn't involve supersymmetry. Okay. In the end, it involves a particular value of the parameter a n. Okay. All right. It's actually counting half BPS states, I should say, and quarter BPS states. Okay. Uh, what is a half BPS state? I'm sorry, I don't, I'm very ignorant. I thought BPS states are short representations of these groups, Kim. Like, uh, the they, they, group happen, they happen to be, yes. Yeah. That's how I thought they were defined. But when you, when you start counting the number of them, it's related, and let me put it a different way. If you start counting the number of energy levels of uh, an oscillator, of a set of ma matrix oscillators with a, uh, uh, which are gauge invariant, the number of gauge invariant states, this particular model she has written down is related to the counting of those. Okay. Which ones are going to be relevant or to depend on the temperature of the system? Okay. Which, but what if, if I may ask a question just a little bit further back? You the two models, um, this SUN one that you the plaquette model and the second one, the physics of them is actually quite different. I mean, uh, the second model on your right here has. A Hagedorn first phase transition, whereas the one on the left doesn't. It has a it has a rather uh, this um, one plaquette model phase transition, <laughs> the Gross-Witten phase transition, but which are, they're quite different. Yeah, right. 
Can you yeah, see I'm, the difference in the sh- in the limit in the shape that you're talking about there? No, in the actually in in the large and limit, their phase structure is similar for both these models. It's it's similar, but not not the same. We, yeah, we, we, have, we, we have to discuss this in detail. But and another more interesting question is, can you determine the leading one over n corrections? For, for which model? For your limit, your limit shape. The oh, order one over n. Oh, yeah, we can do that. I mean, it's just this. So here are these. These are the corrections to limit shape. If so, this this part corres- describe the limit shape, and these are some fluctuations or some excitations over that state, and they correspond to the fluctuations of limit shape. These these are the order one order and corrections. Is this what you are asking? Uh, possibly. And, and have you worked out what they are? They're, they're, or they are order one over n. And this little n yeah, here is the... H, this, these are order h cross correct, corrections and h cross is like one over n squared. E, yes, okay. One over the one over n squared corrections, you have them. Yeah. That's really interesting. I didn't... Uh, I need to understand that better. Just and another connect, connection is uh, to uh, the uh, uh, trace relations for uh, for pure matrices, Bob. Generalizations of Cayley Hamilton theorem. Cayley Hamilton. For many matrices. Hmm. It, the, the, the question she's asking is very closely related to that. Cayley K- Hamilton, or I know is. It's for a single, that's for a single matrix. Yeah. That, they tra- that uh, the matrix satisfies its characteristic equation. But now let me give you two matrices. What relations do two matrices satisfy? Okay, I didn't know that. Okay, fine. They satisfy more complicated relations and they are dependent on N. And uh, it's closely related it to, uh, to that particular, that uh, Jung tableau problem that she's dealing with. I see. <laughs> And these no, yes. are non commuting. Are they? Um, they are non commuting. Yeah, yes. Somebody else has a, has a question. Maybe I just let them know. Yeah. Can I ask, are either of these models related to the gauge Gaussian model? Sorry? Are either of these matrix models related to the gauge Gaussian model? Gauge? Okay. Maybe it's not a standard it's, name. It's probably not. It, the second one is, the right hand one is, the, is exactly the gauge Gaussian model, the one with AN. Okay. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not familiar with this name. It's exactly that. When you expand in the in the parameter, uh, one might call it t. Uh, a n if a n becomes t to the n, which okay. and t is e to the minus beta minus m beta, and you can re re express the thing as a matrix as a matrix model, multi matrix model with gauge invariance. Okay. You go back one page near near to easier to point to, or two pages. <laughs> Sorry, we'll see. I'll probably even further back. Uh, which one? Do you and your action the, again. The, 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 the okay, two actions. The actions. Okay. Yeah. It's the second one here. If you take. Uh, a n to be e to the minus n, the exponential of minus n times beta, 
this one is exactly it, is exactly that. We had a former postdoc here, uh, Francis Dolan, who worked on these questions. Can I ask a little bit on the scaly Hamilton theorem? It is, I can imagine physical applications, okay? Yes, you can. Yeah. Uh, but for a single matrix, okay, I can understand the why this algebraic relation is coming because the spectrum of this matrix splits up, okay? Uh, so depending on the degeneracy, you have a, um, acting on some uh, fixed vector in the Hilbert space, say one, okay? They put, take a state on the algebra, take one and apply this matrix. It's uh, the Hilbert space you get splits into different subspaces. But if I have two matrices, one can generate the entire Hilbert space. For example, take position and momentum. What is the characteristic? What is the Kelly Hamilton generalization? I don't think there is one. Uh, they, they, that's if you take position and momentum, they won't satisfy constraints. Uh, but that's that's also true for an infinite dimensional matrix. If I take an infinite dimensional matrix, it doesn't quite satisfy a Cayley Hamilton relation. Its no. characteristic polynomial is infinite dimensional. Um, so I'm not quite sure, I haven't thought about the infinite dimensional case there, but, but suppose you take a two finite dimensional matrices, two two by two matrices, for instance. Well, you can quickly uh, see that yeah, that uh, you ha have the trace uh, that the matrices are related to. Each of them satisfies the Cayley Hamilton, and then the product of them is also a matrix which satisfies Cayley Hamilton. And, and that it, you can see that there's a there's a complicated algebra there. But it's going, but it's closed. They will satisfy relations. In general, if I take two by two, two different non commuting two by two matrices. And I ask, they're made two by two matrices, so they're hatching on a two dimensional Hilbert space. Okay? It will generate the full Hilbert space. They will generate the full Hilbert space. So there will be no relation. Would, uh, w one matrix will also. One matrix will not separate the vectors. If there is a degeneracy of the vectors, uh, there is a. Uh, depending on, say, two, one eigenvalue is degenerate a certain number of times, then the vectors will not be separated. It generates subspaces. Whereas here, if the two in two by two case, it will generate the full, in general, generically, it generates the full Hilbert space. So I can't imagine an, an algebra. So any matrix can be written in terms of two two by two matrices in two dimensions, generically. Okay? So I don't see what is the relation. Maybe well, I don't know. This is a, that's a very interesting question anyway, okay? Or some use. Yes, we, it is closely related. For instance, the, simple, the one that this will answer most directly is the trace relation. In the trace of uh, X to the N plus one is re-expressible in terms of traces of lower dimensional traces. So if I take two matrices, what are the trace relations? They are determined by by uh, precisely what's going on here. Okay. Anyway, this, that's an aside. It's uh, they take one into a rather different territory. I can send you references on it if you want. Is the, regarding the Cayley Hamilton, I am interested in a reference. Here, I will try to look up. Uh, what is the motivation of Rajesh? He is a hardcore string theorist. So, why was he interested in this problem? Okay. So, I'll go and check it. Okay. Very good. Do we have other questions? No. From someone else?
if not, we can stop the recording and uh, and uh, go to a less formal discussion. So let me do that. Uh, thank, thank you, you again, Nietu. That was very interesting, yeah. stimulating, and we have the advantage of being able to discuss with you here in Dublin. So I'm okay. going to take advantage of it. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Can... can I ask Nietu, where did she, where did you get your degree?